Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like you, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 14 verses, and we're going to be making a transition from the historical section, which was in chapters 1 and 2, to the doctrinal section. And we're going to be thinking this morning particularly about uh, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? And particularly justification is the theme. So, Beginning in verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are are as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And again, we believe God will bless that reading from his precious word. So as we consider this portion together, just to remind ourselves of where we are in the book, we said that we, we've uh, finished the historical section. And in the historical section, the question was, where's the gospel from? Where did Paul get his message from? Where did he get his authority from? And of course, part of the reason is that the false teachers were trying to undermine Paul's authority. They were trying to say he was some kind of inferior apostle to the the twelve uh, uh, in Jerusalem, and, and therefore uh, try and discredit his gospel because he was inferior to those men from Jerusalem. And so, basically, Paul shows us in the first two chapters that first of all, he got his apostleship uh, directly. Uh, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it was given; it was a divinely given apostleship, particularly from the, 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 the Lord Jesus and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And then we find not only that, that um, his message he received by divine revelation as well. He didn't get it from the apostles. And uh, we find that when he went to the apostles, they, they, they in Jerusalem, they gave him the right hand of fellowship. They said they agreed with him. They were standing with him. And they didn't add anything to his message or detract anything from his message. This message that came from God was indeed the pure gospel, needed no additions, amendments, or changes. And so that's what we've seen in the first two chapters. Now in chapter three, we're moving to the doctrinal section. And particularly, we're going to be learning about the marvelous, marvelous truth of justification by faith. That, that message that so grips the heart of Martin Luther 
uh, as we mentioned, that he called this book uh, his uh, Katrina von Bora, just because he was married to uh, Katerina von Bora. He said, I'm married to this epistle because it, it was this epistle as well as the book of the Romans that showed him the marvelous truth of the justification by faith. And he loved it so much. Uh, because he realized he'd, he'd been trying all his life uh, to be justified by works, and it failed miserably. He, he the, the the harder he tried, the worse he felt. And so, when he saw this message that justification was by faith, he he reveled in it. And so, as we look at chapter three, I hope we're going to revel in the truth of justification by faith that a man is declared right before God, not on the basis of works but on the basis of faith in the finished work of Christ. Marvelous, marvelous truth. And so that's kind of our theme today as we consider this. And we're going to look in verses 1 through 5 about the Galatians' own experience. What was their experience? And he's going to remind them of what happened to them, how they were justified by faith, how they came uh, to receive the Holy Spirit as a result of being brought into a right relationship with God. How did that work? How was What was their experience like? And then from verse 6 through 14, we're going to be looking at the fact that their experience had a definite scriptural basis. So in other words, he doesn't want to base all his argument on experience because a lot of people experience a lot of weird things and it doesn't match with scripture. What he starts with is, this is your experience, 1 through 5, and verses 6 through 14. Here's how your experience matches the testimony of the Word of God. And those two things that always have to be kept in line together. Uh, because, you know, again, people have some very strange experiences. But when you put them in connection with what the Scripture says, they don't line up. And so their experiences are, are maybe very real and valid to them, but they don't match what the testimony of the word of God says. And so he wants to show that what happened in Galatia, it was a genuine experience, but it was an experience that is backed up fully by the word of God. You know, that's always the safest way to be. Experience and scripture uh, married together beautifully. So he begins with some very strong language. He says in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? And so what he's saying is to embrace a doctrine which sets aside the grace of God and the death of Christ that they have heard was foolishness in the extreme and showed a complete lack of understanding and logical thinking. It's almost like he's saying, you guys have lost your minds. You're abandoning this marvelous truth of justification by faith based entirely on God's grace through the merits of Jesus Christ, and you're abandoning that and going back to this legal system of the law. And he said, this isn't, we would put it this way, this is insanity. You guys have lost your minds. And so he says, oh, foolish Galatians. And then notice he says, who? He recognizes that somebody has put them under a spell. Somebody has corrupted their minds, corrupted their thinking. And so the question is, who is this person? Who has come in with this, this wrong teaching that has taken you away from this marvelous message? Who has done that? Uh, who has bewitched you? We're going to think more about this individual as we go through. And sadly, it doesn't stay with an individual because this bad teaching spreads and it's them and they. Uh, but it's kind of we're going to see it as we go through the epistle. But right now, he just says, who, who has bewitched you? Who has put you, as it were, under their spell? Now, again, it's not literal. It's not that they're literally under a spell, but it's it's almost like they're showing the effects of that, that almost like they've been mesmerized. Somebody's put them under a spell. Their thinking has become so clouded, so unbiblical, it seems like some kind of spell has been cast upon them. It's very easy for me to relate to this because I meet people that come under a false teaching that is very prevalent in our day, and once they come under that teaching, it's almost like they can't read the text 
clearly anymore. <laughs> yeah, they, they see the text, but they see it through this false teaching now. And every verse is kind of looked at through this tunnel vision. And it's almost like they can't even read anymore. They're, it's like they're under a spell. They're totally mesmerized. And so he, he said, who's done this to you? Who, who has put you under this spell? Who has, has, has so, as it were, bewitched you that you can't even think clearly anymore? And he says, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified amongst you? He takes them back to the time when they first heard the glad tidings, the gospel message. And he said that when that happened, he said it was it was so real, it was almost as if they were actually there at Calvary and they were witnessing the crucifixion. And they were they, they were seeing the one on the center cross and they were being asked to make a decision. What are you going to do about the one on the center cross? Are you going to believe in him? Are you going to trust in him as your savior and as your Lord? Are you going to embrace him? Or, or are you going to reject him? And so uh, the gospel was preached so clearly, uh, it was as if, uh, and the, the word, the language here of uh, uh, Christ being set forth uh, so evidently, being evidently set forth, crucified among you, is language like this, that it, it was so clear and plain, uh, a message, as if it was almost placarded, placarded in large letters before their very eyes. So they, they couldn't mistake it. And by the way, isn't it wonderful when you hear gospel preaching that is so clear and so powerful and so real, it's like you're stood at the cross and you have to make a decision. What are you going to do with this man who is called the Christ? Are you going to accept him? Are you going to re reject him? Well, when the gospel came to Galatia, the preaching was that powerful. And he's reminding them of that. Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. And by the way, uh, Dave and I had a long conversation on the way uh, from Halifax uh, out here. And we were talking a lot about the gospel and, and how valuable the gospel is, not only to lost sinners, but to the saints of God. How valuable it is for us to go back to Calvary, as it were, and see him hanging there for our sin, on account of our sin, and to just how it warms the heart of the Christian to be taken back, as it were, to Calvary and the marvelous work of Christ. We never get over that. We should never, ever get to the point where, oh, it's just going to be a gospel message. No, no, I get to hear again. Uh, something of the love of God, something of the, the marvelous work of my Savior on Calvary's cross. Oh, what a privilege it is to hear that and to see that. So we need this. We need Christ being set forth, crucified amongst us. It's such a marvelous, marvelous thing. And so he reminds them of what they had experienced. It was so vivid. It was so graphic as Christ was presented crucified. Of course, that's what Paul did. He said, you know, that when he came to places, he had no other agenda, right? He, all he wanted to do was preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message. He didn't want to get carried away with human eloquence and human wisdom just to simply fet, set forth a crucified Savior. That was his heart's desire. And oh, may God help us that have responsibility to proclaim the word of of God to be able to set forth in a very clear manner Jesus Christ evidently set forth crucified among people so they have to make a decision concerning the one on the center cross and so this is uh, the, the the truth that was proclaimed the greatness of his person the greatness of his work the reason why it was done on account of sinners and it was clearly laid out before them like they were personally there and witnessing it. And so he says in verse two, this only would I learn of you, received you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Interesting, isn't it? Hearing faith. Uh, these two words are mentioned here. He says, did you receive the spirit uh, by the, the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And of course, we we know from elsewhere in Paul's writings, he put such a, an emphasis on this, didn't he? Romans chapter 10, verse 17, one of my favorite verses. Faith comes 
by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so uh, hearing refers to the message they heard, faith to the means by which they re received salvation, right? How they responded to that message. They heard it and they believed it. They put their trust in it, their full confidence in the message that they heard. And, and that lays out the fundamental difference between the principle of law and the principle of grace. Under law, we're, we're supposedly blessed and grow spiritually by earning and deserving. Okay, it's a system of works, earning and you earn merit, you deserve merit by what you do. Under grace, it's believing and receiving. <laughs> oh, isn't it so much? better just to believe and receive rather than to seek to to earn and deserve because ultimately we can't earn it and none of us deserve it <laughs> and so so much better uh, to simply believe and receive and so god deals with us under the the principle of grace and we should we should never want to go back to the principle of law we should rejoice in the principle of grace, that it's all about believing and receiving. And so this is what he's saying to them. Would I look, did you receive the Spirit? How did? Of course, we'll go back to what is the gospel. When you believe that Jesus died as your substitute on that center cross and you put your entire eternal destiny in his hands and say, I believe you died in my place, in my stead. One of the things that happens when a person believes that message is the Spirit of God comes to take up residence within them. They receive the Spirit. Remember on the day of uh, uh, the gospel coming to the Gentiles for the first time in Acts chapter 10, and as Peter set forth the work of Christ, as they listened to it, as they heard it, they believed it, and the Spirit of God came upon them, just as it did on Peter and the others on the day of Pentecost. What happened to them? Well, they heard the message, they believed it, and the Spirit of God came and took up residence in their lives upon their faith in the finished work of Christ. And so he said, how did you receive the Spirit? Was it by the works of the law? Evidently not. That law message hadn't even arrived there yet. The, the false teachers hadn't even come to town yet. It was a it was a message of Christ and Him crucified that was set forth, uh, evidently so clearly amongst them. And and so when they believed that, that's when they received the Spirit. It wasn't by the works of the law. It was by the hearing of faith. And so he says uh, a very interesting thing here in st stressing this that the Holy Spirit is not a prize earned through the works of the law, but he is a precious gift received based on the finished work of Christ. <laughs> oh, how thankful we are that we don't have to earn the prize of the gift of the Holy Spirit by hard work and labor and diligence, but it's simply because we believe the gospel. The Spirit of God came and took up residence in our lives and essentially put us under new management. And it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Every one of us today, we're under new management. <laughs> uh, the Holy Spirit is now resident in our lives and by implication should be president in our lives. We have now a new indwelling heavenly guest who has been given to us upon hearing and believing the gospel message. And so in verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? How can you be so foolish? How can you be so illogical? If you began your Christian life in the Spirit, how could that Christian life be possibly completed in the flesh. Now, by the way, this is not just a message for the Galatians. I think all of us have to learn this lesson. And so when we first get saved, it's so evident a work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who's convicted us. 
of sin and righteousness and judgment. He is the one who has set forth Christ to us through the preaching of the gospel and made it real that it's all about him and he died for us. And and so it really is a, a work of the Holy Spirit. And then we believe the gospel, the spirit comes and lives within us. And so the whole Christian life, it's a miraculous work of the spirit of God. It, it, it really is. It's a marvelous, marvelous thing. And that's how it begins. But how does the Christian life continue? Having begun that way, is it made perfect by the flesh? And sometimes we have to learn that, okay, now I'm a new creature in Christ, and it's a wonderful thing to be a new creature. Um, but, and of course, uh, uh, initially there's a marvelous change, and we can see the evidence. So everything's different. You know, the, we often talk about the sky's uh, deeper blue, the grass is sweeter green. Uh, it, it's amazing. Conversion is so absolutely thrilling. It's a wonderful thing. But it's not long that we've been a Christian that the old flesh begins to manifest itself again. <laughs> and we realize that although we're, we're new creatures, the old man is still there and and so we, we kind of think oh well you know self-will determination we can we can we can really live this christian life and so we kind of knuckle down and we try in the energy of the flesh to live the christian life and it really is only till we get to that place of romans 7 oh wretched man that i am who will deliver me that we realize that not only does a christian life begin with the spirit if it's ever going to be a fruitful Christian life, it must continue in moment by moment dependence upon the Spirit. And so the problem with the Galatians is that they began in the Spirit. It clearly was a work of the Holy Spirit. But now they're, because of these false teachers, they're wanting to go back under this work system which is doing things in our efforts to seek to please God uh, by, by uh, agreeing to try to keep the law. And so he, he says, how, how do you, could you think this way? How could you be so deceived to think this way? If you could not obtain salvation by works, how can you produce holiness by works after conversion? If spiritual life began in the spirit, it must be developed by the spirit. The whole of the new life is a supernatural life. And so it's impossible for circumcision and law keeping of any kind to bring us to Christian maturity. Only the spirit can produce Christ likeness in our lives. And so Paul is indicating that the realm of law keeping, there's no provision really for this life of victory it, it, it's actually designed to show us we can't do it and so as a retro, retrograde step uh, but for them to go back to that old system and so don't be foolish don't go back he says uh, let's move on and let's move on in dependence upon the holy spirit let's not go back to this old old system and then he says an interesting thing in verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? And of course, in those early days, and still for many today, uh, when you come to Christ, there there is opposition with that. There There is rejection that comes with that. Uh, for many people, they, they receive that very definitely. When they get saved, there's rejection from family. There's rejection from your contemporaries, your your old friends, uh, they uh, they don't want to go with you anymore because in, in their minds, you've become a religious fanatic and you've become dull and boring and you no longer want to go out and paint the town red and all this kind of stuff. And so, so usually conversion brings with it a, a definite sense of rejection. And so he says, have you suffered so many things in vain? Was it all in vain? Uh, all this rejection from your contemporaries from your family from society uh, is is that all in vain and um, we, we certainly um see that uh in in for instance uh, these we said that the background uh, to the galatian assemblies is acts 13 and 14 and if you just go back to chapter 14 just for a second and you see that that it, it was actually uh in 
in that region that we call Galatia, that Paul was even stoned and left for dead. And so it shows you something of the fanaticism of religion, the religion the Galatians were saved out of. Look at verse 19 of Acts 14. And there came there the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. Now, p persuading the people is the those the, the, the Lyconians, the, the people who were local to that area, persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. And so, uh, again, re religious people, even even kind of the pagan religious people, uh, there, there's usually when somebody rejects that whole system and trusts in the work of Christ, there's usually a, a kickback. There's usually some rejection. There's usually some opposition. And clearly the Galatians had suffered that. They suffered many things. Was it all in vain? Was it all a waste of time? Because now they're going backwards. But then notice what he says, if it be yet in vain. You see, they were beginning this process of turning, but Paul was convinced that it wasn't a guaranteed thing. There was still hope for the Galatians to come back to the truth. And so notice in chapter 5, verse 10, again, we see something of his hope that they're not going to make the complete defection. And so in verse 10, he says of chapter 5, I have confidence in you through the Lord, and that's where his confidence was, in the Lord and God's word to do its work, not in, not in him, but confident in the Lord, that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. There's that person again. What he's saying is, uh, I, I'm convinced that that you're, you're going to not follow this man, but you're going to follow truth. And so he, he still holds out hope for them. And by the way, there's always hope. Uh, I, I've met many people who we talked about contemporary false doctrines that people embrace and so much so that they can hardly see the bible and it's plain literal meaning anymore but i've seen a lot of them have gone into that system and praise god they've come out again <laughs> it's almost like uh, the cataracts have been removed and they can see the bible again like it's meant to be seen and they've been delivered from that system praise god for that yeah, and so he he is still has a measure of confidence that they would turn away from such false teaching. We have to retain confidence in God's word, don't we? That it's even able to persuade people who have been bewitched, who have been put under a spell, who have been deceived. And so Paul still holds out a measure of confidence to them that it wasn't in vain, this suffering. It wasn't in vain because he's convinced that they're going to go back to the simplicity of the truth. And so he says in verse 5, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. He, he talked about their past reception of the Spirit at conversion in verse 2, and now he's talking about the present supply, if you like, of the Spirit's power. Uh, they had witnessed powerful evidence of the Spirit working through the Word, amongst them and the ones who were ministering that word in such power how did they do that was that by the works of the law no they weren't law preachers <laughs> uh, they were people who believed the simple gospel but uh, and they believed in the power of the holy spirit uh, in the preaching of the gospel so so they'd seen evidence and they'd seen miracles done amongst them uh, you know again this is a transitional period, the, the early days of Christianity, where there are definite uh, sign gifts still evident, and there are miracles being performed, and they had witnessed some of them. And again, let's go back to Acts 14, uh, and we'll, we'll see uh, something of this. In Acts 14 and verse 3, uh, just a couple of references to this, this evidence of, of the Spirit working. It says in Acts 14, verse 3, uh, Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Uh, 
Now, again, remember signs and wonders. Signs are pointing to something. So this is pointing to the the the, the reality of, of Christ's power. Okay, it's pointing to something. And then wonder is the response that, that it comes from these signs. And it calls people to wonder at the marvelous workings of God uh, in their midst. And so this is something that they had witnessed. And further on in the passage, look at verse 8. Here's an example. There was a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beheld him, and perceiving he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconians, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So here's, here's another example where, in other words, this was all happening in the region of Galatia. And of course, how did these people do it? Were they law preachers that, would, that were having such evidence uh, of God working through them? through this miraculous demonstrations? Were they lawmen? Uh, were they pushing the law of Moses? What were they preaching? Circumcision? No, none of that stuff. What were they preaching? They were preaching Christ and him crucified. And it was done in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the whole thought here is this. He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, did it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And of course, the answer is absolutely obvious was based on faith of the word of God and the truth of God that had been revealed, the gospel message. And so he makes these things clear. Now, having talked about their experience, and this is what they'd experienced, this is what they had experienced personally, this is what they'd witnessed. So they'd experienced it in, in both hearing it, believing it, and seeing it. And so from verse 6 onwards now, he's saying, well, is there a biblical basis for this position that he is so insisting upon uh, that salvation, uh, justification uh, is by faith and not by the works of the law? Is there any scriptural basis for this, that what they've experienced is really true? Or uh, are these lawmen, are these telling the truth here? So this is a big question for them. And so he appeals to the scriptures. Now, he's going to give, in verses 6 through 14, six quotations from the Old Testament. And he's going to show these six quotations to show that the Galatians' experience rested entirely on a biblical basis. Okay, so this is what he's trying to do. Uh, and these six scriptures that he's going to quote are in connection with four major points that he's going to make. So I'm going to give you what the points are, and then we'll look at the six scriptures. So first is the position of Abraham, because you see, the circumcision party, they, they're kind of like Moses, but they also liked Abraham, uh, of course, their, their connection with the, the father uh, of the Jewish religion and in their minds and the whole Jewish system. And, and so they, they really liked Abraham. So he, he says, OK, what is the position of Abraham in verse six and seven? And we say, what was his experience? How, how was he made right with God? How did it go with him? Was it the law that 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 caused Abraham to be so greatly blessed? Is that what it was all about? So what was Abraham's position, verse 6 and 7? And then what about the promise of blessing to the Gentiles? We're going to see the promise of blessing in verse 8 and 9. Uh, how was that given? What was the basis of that? And then in verses 10 through 12, he's going to talk about the problem of the law. And again, scripturally, the problem of the law, the huge problem of the law is that it requires complete compliance in order for blessing to be received. You have to be fully obedient. And if you're not, you're under a curse. So problem of the law, 10 through 12, sorry, 10 through 12, and then verses 13 and 14, we're going to look at the provision of Christ, the provision of Christ, why Christ died, what the whole purpose is, the scriptural basis for justification by faith, position of Abraham, Promise of blessing, problem of the law, the provision of Christ. So the position of Abraham. 
And so we're going to observe just something here in the text as we, we look at these things. Quite often, what he's going to do is he's going to state a fact. So he's going to do that in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Fact stated. And then verse 7, he's going to draw a conclusion from the fact. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Okay, so he's going to state a fact from Scripture biblical basis and then he's going to draw a conclusion and he's going to do that all the way through uh, these four segments that we're going to be looking at today so we're going to we're going to follow that little pattern uh, which is nice to see and so notice it says uh, again in verse six even as abraham believed god now i want you to notice that it says abraham believed god it didn't say abraham believed in god he believed God. There's a difference. You see, the demons believe in God and they tremble. There's a lot of lost souls that believe in God, but they don't really believe God. Do you see the distinction? Uh, all around us, there are people that, if you ask them, do you believe in God? They say, yeah. So then you say, okay, well, do you believe God? They say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, do you believe what God says about you? that you're a, a sinner, that you can't save yourself? Do you believe what God says about his son, that he's the only savior? See, there's a difference between believing God than believing in God. A lot of people believe in God, but they don't believe God. When he says something, they don't believe it. <laughs> and so Abraham believed God. When God said something, he believed it. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that we were more like Abraham in every area. Now, we are, in a sense, how we got saved. God said it. We believed it. Praise the Lord for that. But when it comes to the rest of the Christian life, do we really believe God? <laughs> it's good to ask ourselves that question. Abraham believed God. And then it says it was accounted to him for righteousness. So let's just kind of work through this a little bit. So he's appealing to scripture, we said, and the scripture is Genesis 15 and verse 6. So we want to go back there, see the biblical basis for what he's saying. So we're going back a long way, back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. And this is the beginning of the doctrine of justification by faith, I suppose you could say. It says in verse 6 of Genesis 15, speaking of Abraham, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this is the scripture. He believed in the Lord. And what did he believe? He believed what God said. Uh, he, he told him, look towards the, the, the heaven, verse 5, and tell the stars. If you're able to number them, he said to them, so shall thy seed be. Your descendants are going to be, be, be like the stars. And it says he believed in the Lord. He believed what God said. Okay, even though it looked unlikely, he didn't have a single descendant at that time, and he didn't have the possibility, it seemed, humanly speaking, of a single descendant. But God says, look at the stars, you're going to have as many descendants as the stars that are in the heaven, and it says he believed in the Lord. He just believed what God said. And so <clears throat> that's the biblical basis, Genesis 15, 6. And so we notice the words uh, back in Galatians 3, it, so, so it says... Uh, he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. I want to just focus on three simple words. Believed, accounted, righteousness. <laughs> believed, accounted, righteousness. And so what do these, these th simple things speak to us of? The word accounted is a very important word in this passage and in Paul's writings. Uh, sometimes it's translated as reckoned, and so it's it, it's, we're all, it's a language of, of accounts, a accounting, reckoning, uh, putting to someone's account is the idea, right? So it's, it's all accounting language. And so the, the idea is this, it, it, literally to put to one's account, to, to reckon uh, uh, on this being a reality, a truth. So Abraham's part was simply to accept the word of God, and God's part was to reckon Abraham's faith that he believed God for righteousness. 
not instead of righteousness in other words it's not um faith was not mator- meritorious there's no merit in abraham's faith. abraham just simply believed god and because he believed god it was put to his account for righteousness not abraham's righteousness god put his righteousness because abraham had no righteousness he's like every other human being we have no righteousness of our own. So he didn't put Abraham's righteousness to his, he put God's own righteousness was put to his account. And that's the truth of justification by faith. That when we believe in Christ as the sinner's substitute who died in our place, in our stead, we believe that uh, he's our only hope for eternity. God takes that our belief that he, that he Christ did that and he puts God's righteousness to our account and that's an amazing thing isn't it and so uh, abraham's faith did not make him righteous abraham's god made him righteous <laughs> abraham simply believed god and it was put to his account reckoned to him for righteousness and that is the marvelous truth what we call justification. And so this is Abraham. This is his experience. This is what happened with him. He simply believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Righteousness was put in his account. And then he says in verse 7, by way of implication now, um, drawing a conclusion, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Those that are of faith are the children of Abraham. There's a family resemblance. In one sense, um, uh, we become real Abrahams ourselves. <laughs> we become just like him. He believed God. It was put to his account for righteousness. We believe God. It's put to our account for righteousness. And so we become just like him in the sense of we, we simply believe what God says. And so there's this beautiful family resemblance between us and him. And the family resemblance is we believe God. So look back now uh, to uh, John's gospel, just for a second. I want you just to see in John 8, a couple of scriptures, John 8, 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? So the Lord Jesus is dialoguing with the, the, the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, and they, they make a big point. We're Abraham's seed. We're Abraham's descendants, you see. And, and well, we've never been in bondage to anybody, which is kind of the most farcical statement you've ever heard because their whole history is one of bondage because of their uh, failures uh, to obey God and keep the law. They're, they experienced bondage from the very beginning. Verse 39 it says, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. In other words, if you really were Abraham's children, you would be like Abraham. What was Abraham like? He believed God. <laughs> That's what he was like. And, and so faith would mark you. That's what would mark you if you were really Abraham's uh, descendants. And um, the Pharisees claim to be children of Abraham is contested. They were not like him at all. Um, <laughs> Abraham's true descendants are not those who carry the mark of circumcision in their bodies, but those who are marked by faith. That's the idea, Abraham's true descendants. Not that carry the mark of circumcision in their bodies, but they're marked by faith. And so, actually, in that dialogue in John 8, the Lord says, actually, you, you actually resemble somebody else. You're like your father, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. <laughs> That's a tragic, tragic section. But here he's simply saying this, by implication, drawing a conclusion, uh, know ye therefore they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. These are, the, these are the true children of Abraham. They do the works of Abraham. They specifically believe God. That's, that's who the true children of Abraham are. And of course, we might ask the question, when did this all take place? Uh, this Genesis 15 in verse 6. Uh, we'll just look at Romans just for a minute. We, 
we're not studying Romans, but it's just kind of interesting that this Genesis 15, 6 has something to say in Romans as well. And uh, we just look at a couple of verses. Genesis, uh, sorry, Romans 4, verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. There's the Genesis 15, verse 6 again. Notice verse 10. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. In other words, when did this happen to Abraham? <laughs> was it when he was circumcised or, or before he was circumcised? Well, it happened before he was circumcised. And so his, his justification was Genesis 15. His circumcision was Genesis 17. Chronologically, it happened afterwards. And so uh, his being made right with God was not on the basis of circumcision or keeping the law. It was basically on the basis of faith completely in, in what God had said. In fact, circumcision was the seal of the righteousness he already had through faith. Now we must move on. In verse 8 and 9, we want to think of the promise of blessing. And so it says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the Gentiles through, because the same word that's used elsewhere is Gentiles. So the scripture foreseeing that God would justify or declare righteous the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed. So the thought here is this, that it was never intended that this wonderful truth of justification should be just for the Jews only. For seeing that God would justify the heathen, the Gentiles, through faith. And so salvation is definitely not for the Jews only, but equally for the Gentiles. He states a fact again in verse 8, and he draws a conclusion in verse 9. And so the the fact that he states, again, is a quotation uh, that he has in mind uh, in from Genesis 12 in verse 3. So again, let's go back to Genesis 12, verse 3, and just see. And by the way, this was before Abraham was even justified himself. He gets his declared righteous occurs in chapter 15. But in chapter 12, what we see is that God is showing, even before Abraham, chronologically was ever justified by faith it was ever god's intention to bring blessing to the gentiles even before abraham was justified genesis 12 verse 3 and i will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and then notice the end of verse 3 and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed so this is not just for Jews. Actually, in Abraham, all the families of the earth, whether they're physical descendants of Abraham or not, God intends to bless them. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So again, we notice the chronology. That Genesis 12 precedes Genesis 15. And so Paul does this to show that God's purpose existed his purpose to bless Gentiles existed even before Abraham was justified. And so it's wonderful to know that's always been God's intent to bring blessing to Gentiles. And so uh, notice as well, uh, verse 8, he says, and the scripture for seeing. I, I just love this. He, he actually personifies scripture here. Uh, it almost makes scripture into a living person. You, you see that? The scripture foreseeing. It's not only here that you see this. Let's just look at Galatians 3.22. Again, it says, but the scripture hath concluded. <laughs> Almost like the scripture itself is coming to a conclusion. The scripture foresees, the scripture concluded. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 17. Romans 9, verse 17. Romans 9, verse 17, it says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. It was actually God who said to Pharaoh, for this purpose I raised thee up. But it's, it says, the scripture says. 
So when the scripture speaks, God speaks. That's the point, isn't it? Uh, isn't it wonderful to have the word of God and know that when it speaks, it's speaking as the oracles of God. It's speaking as if this is God speaking. Is God speaking to us through the word of God? So the scripture foreseeing back in verse 8 of chapter 3, God and his word can't really be separated. What is predicted of one is predicted of the other. The inspiration of the scriptures is being emphasized greatly by the Apostle Paul here. And so the scripture is saying that God would justify the heathen through faith. That is all the families of the earth. It would be available to any one of them on the simple base of faith. And so this is the idea. God uh, is going out to the nations. That's the idea. The, the good news. He wants all the families of the earth to experience this blessing of justification by faith. So God had Gentiles in mind as well as Jews. And of course, it's good news. Isn't that wonderfully good news, seen as perhaps everybody on this call are Gentiles? And it was always God's intention that he would bless the Gentiles through faith, just uh, through depending on Abraham's seed. Uh, being singular, that one seed being Christ, believing on him, that's how blessing would come to the Gentiles if they would believe on him. So preaching the gospel or good news beforehand did not in any way include the works of the law. I just want you to see that. This good news, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, it was on the basis of faith. He preached this good news before to Abraham saying in thee all the families of the earth will be blessed. The blessing wasn't going to come through them keeping the law. The blessing was going to come on the principle, the simple, delightful principle of faith. So then, here's a lovely conclusion. They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And here we are this morning. We're seated here together. <laughs> And are we blessed? Oh, are we blessed. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are so incredibly blessed. And, and how did we get blessed? Was it through trying to keep the law? <laughs> no, none of us could do that. We were blessed through faith. And so in that sense, uh, just like Abraham, he got his blessing by faith, by believing what God said, and we have received blessing. Now, our time has fastly come to a close this morning, which is a real shame because we're getting to a really exciting part because we've already had the word blessed used twice in verse 8 and 9. Just notice that. At the end of verse 8, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. Verse 9, so then they which will be of faith are blessed. So twice we've had blessing mentioned. And then, as we move into the, the next section, what we're going to be seeing is cursing. Cursed. And it says, just notice, it's actually going to mention five times in verses 10, 11, uh, down to verse 13, cursed is going to be used. Verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, again, because of lack of time, I can't go into this a lot. But just so happened this morning in my daily devotional readings, as I was just working through my reading schedule, I was instructed to read Deuteronomy 27 and 28. <laughs> and 27 and 28 is the two mountains, right? Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And on one mountain, the children of Israel were to stand, six of the tribes, and they were to pronounce curses for those that don't keep the law. And the other mountain, another six tribes, were to pronounce blessing for those that could keep the law. <laughs> and so blessing and cursing. So here we, we're, in a sense, he's taken us back to these two mountains and cursing and blessing. And what he's going to show us is that if we put ourselves under law, we've got to continue to do it. 
all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. From the day that we put ourselves under it, that we actually become circumcised and commit to the thing, then we're obligated to keep everything written. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. There are actually 613 separate <laughs> requirements to keep the law. And you've got to do that till the very day you die. And if you fail in any one, you put yourself under a curse. Wow. Why would anybody do that when they can experience such blessing simply by believing what God says? Well, we have to wait till next week to unpack Gerizim and Ebal and then go to another mountain where Jesus bore the curse for us called Calvary. But we'll have to wait. That hour went way too quick.